Well, it's like a 200% increase in attendance ship today. It's very nice to see actually more than five people in the lecture at a time. Okay, so um, this is the official last day of class, so I'm just doing tutorials today. There's no theory. I finished that last Wednesday, okay? So um, we, I will be covering uh, random processes and noise analysis questions. This will be in the same caliber of what you'll be expected to know and to solve on the uh, final exam uh, that's happening next week. And then next Wednesday, there's no class. So please do not show up. If you do, that's your fault, not mine, because I will not be here. Okay, so next Wednesday, there's no class. I'm going to let you use that time to study for the final exam. Okay? Anyway, so I sent this email uh, a couple of hours ago. Not a couple, maybe a few hours ago, just in case you didn't get it. All right, so I'm just going to reiterate what, those, what that information is to you. So this is just final exam information. So what's going to happen, I sent a, a preliminary email a couple weeks ago just to make sure, but uh, the final exam will happen next Monday, July 4th. All right, it's going to happen uh, between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. in room E and G, LG 11. So it's not going to be here. Don't come here. It's going to be downstairs in E and G, LG 11, which is the big room with about 300 seats or so. So uh, I'll be spacing you out, you know, every four or five seats just to get, let yourself be more comfortable and all that and to make sure that you don't copy your neighbor. All right. So there's going to be three hours and then... Um, in terms of calculator, it's just a standard, just a scientific calculator with no graphics, and no, no graphing capabilities or anything with heavy memory or storage, right? Uh, in terms of formula sheets, those will be provided to you. So there is a sample copy of the final exam formula sheets that will be seen on your final exam online. If you go to the exams section, there is a section which is the uh, under uh, formula sheets. There's going to be a PDF which is called final exam sample sheets. So it's basically just going to be the same formula sheets that you've seen for the midterm with the addition of the best cell tables. So that's just, that's pretty much the only differences. So you've got the, uh, the Fourier transform pairs, the trigonometric identities, all your basic identities and uh, tra transform pairs and properties you need for both F and omega, as well as the Bessel coefficients that you need in case you have to solve for the uh, FM spectrum for a single tone wave. Okay. So let's see here. So final exam format, it will consist of six questions that are, you know, they're, uh, it's mostly going to be, uh, you know, mathematical means, you know, calculation based with some, you know, small discussion questions based answers, not too much. All right. Um, please note that each question is not equally weighted. So you're not expected to spend uh, an equal amount of time per question. Some will take a little longer than others. Some may be quicker. So, but in total, it should take about three hours to solve and you should have time to double check. I'll make sure you have time to double check all of your answers before you leave. Okay. In terms of what you're responsible for, in terms of the lecture materials, some profs like to ask questions that are cumulative. I do not endorse that philosophy. Once I ask you stuff for the midterm, that is it. I do not ask you that anymore. So you're only responsible for material after the midterm. Do not study any material before. If you need to, if, if there are questions that are, you know, that will reference prior material, it should be common knowledge. You should know what modulation is. You should know that the Fourier transform of a cosine is two impulses, that kind of stuff. That you should already know. But uh, you don't need to know specifically about like uh, distortionless transmission or, or any amplitude modulation specific questions. You don't need to know that. All right. So this, these are the lectures you are responsible for. So lectures one to four were concerned with the midterm, uh, you know, midterm exam and stuff they need to know for the midterm. So the material from here on in is basically lecture five to lecture ten. So lecture five is the uh, phase lock loop and carrier acquisition. Then we start taking a look at uh, super heterodyne receiver and RF receivers in general, and then we take a look at FM modulation and then random processes, and then finally uh, noise analysis and communication systems. So from lectures five to ten is what you're responsible for. Do not study material before the midterm because I will not ask that. You're wasting your time. All right. So that is the lecture material you're responsible for in terms of tutorial questions. It's basically all the tutorials that were not covered in the midterm. So tutorials one through five was, you know, AM modulation, single side and double side and that kind of stuff was the, before the midterm. That you don't need to know for this exam. Well, there, there, you know, there is some, some basic knowledge you do need to know for specific, specifically asking for double sideband express carrier questions or single sideband, you don't. Okay. So you're only responsible for four tutorials. So tutorial six was a super heterodyne question, you know, super heterodyne questions. Tutorial seven and eight are FM modulation, and then including today's tutorial, which will be random processes and noise analysis, is what you need to know for the final exam. All right, so the lecture material from five to ten, as well as tutorial six to nine, you were responsible for. Uh, it's pretty much and anything asked from lectures five to ten or tutorial six to nine are fair game. Okay, so if you can solve these questions in confidence, uh, you should be in good shape for the final exam. It may be a good idea to take a look at final exam questions from the 
previous years, they were a lot more difficult. So if you can solve those with confidence, then you should be able to ace this final exam with no difficulty. Okay? All right, so that should be it. So if there's any other information regarding the final exam that, hasn't, that I haven't talked about now that is important for you to know for the final exam, then I will certainly let you know of that information well in advance before the final exam. All right, so lectures five and 10, tutorial six and nine are what you need to know for this final exam. Do not study uh, the uh, material from the midterm up onto or prior, okay? So that's, that's what I have for you in terms of that. Are there any questions before I start the tutorial? For those of you who do not have a copy of their midterm, I have them here. So you can just pick them up uh, during the break or whenever you wish. But I have them here. If you don't pick them up, then I'll give them to you during your final exam because I don't want to have them in my possession anymore. Okay? All right. So I have seven questions for you today. Optimistically, we should be able to get out of here hopefully by 7.30. Okay? Let's, let's hopefully I'll get out of here. Because I only have seven questions for you today, so it shouldn't take that long. All right? So let's see here. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is the last tutorial we hear. So we're going to start off with some random processes, just a warm up. Okay, so we have this random process. Remember, our random process is basically a random variable with a time attribute associated to it. So the selection of the time waveform is random, but once you determine that actual waveform, the actual waveform itself is deterministic. Okay, so we have this random process here. So it's just a cosine wave. The frequency f and the phase theta zero are constants but the amplitude is uniformly distributed. So if you remember from the examples from the last couple of classes, the phase was uniformly distributed, but this time the amplitude is uniformly distributed. So the little bit of curveball here, okay? So it's a uniformly distributed random variable that is defined between two constants, alpha and beta, and we will assume that, of course, over the interval. So we obviously we will assume that alpha is gonna be less than beta, right? and they're both gonna be non-zero. So, these are the steps that you, so what we need to basically do is we have to determine whether or not this random process is white sense stationary. So there's two criteria that you need to prove that a random process is white sense stationary. So the first thing that you have to prove is to determine that the mean is basically constant. It doesn't vary over time, it's just a constant number, whatever that would be. And then the second would, to pre, would be proving that the autocorrelation function only depends on the time length, which is tau. Okay, so we have to determine if we can satisfy these two constraints, and if we do, then yes, this is certainly white sense stationary, but if we don't, then it's not white sense stationary. Okay, so that is what we're going to do now. Okay, so before we start, the PDF of this random, of this, uh, you know, the random variable is very simple. So it's basically going to go between alpha and beta, okay, and the amplitude is 1 minus beta over alpha. If you remember what the PDF of a uniformly distributed random variable is, right? It's gonna be one over beta minus alpha when you know we're between two variables. So let's call this x, right? Okay. And zero otherwise. Okay, so that would be the the uh, probability distribution function for a random variable that is uniform. Okay, so that's just a little precursor there. So the next thing is we have to determine what the mean is. How do we calculate this? Okay, so it's basically the integral over all possible values of your PDF. So this becomes, uh, let's see, your x of t. So this is the random process and then the actual PDF itself. D of x. All right? Okay, so if you take a look here, every, it's non-zero except for between alpha and beta, all right? So in this case, we're going to go between alpha and beta. Okay. So the random process is a cosine, and then what was it? Uh, two pi. Okay. So two pi f t plus theta zero. So that's all constant. And then we have the PDF, which is one over beta minus alpha. Okay. And then what you have to do is you have to integrate over all possible values of your random variable. So you have to integrate with respect to A. If you remember the previous question a couple of, uh, couple of lectures ago, the random variable was your phase. So you're integrating with respect to whatever the random variable is, which is theta. In this case, a random variable is A. So you have to integrate with respect to A. So this is your random variable. OK. All right. So if you take a look here, these two things are pretty much constants. So you can actually take those outside. So what is, what is required to be integrated is just the A variable itself. Everything else can stay outside. 
So what's going to happen here is the expected value would be, so let me see here, sorry, it's uh, cosine and 2 pi ft plus theta 0, and then beta minus alpha is here, okay? And then we integrate between alpha and beta of a dA. Okay? All right. So if you don't know what the integral of this is, shame on you, but we can certainly go ahead and do this. The integral of x is a half x squared. In this case, the integral of a will be a half a squared, and then it's bound between the two limits alpha and beta. Okay, so half a squared evaluated between alpha and beta. Okay, so cosine 2 pi ft plus theta 0. Okay, so we're going to have a 2 here because of this factor of a half. So this is going to come over here. And then finally we have beta squared minus alpha squared. Okay. You can go a little further if you like. You can, you can pretty much stop here, but what you can do is you know that this can factor into beta plus alpha and then beta minus alpha. Right? So this is the, uh, you know, the uh, perfect squares, the differences between the two. So if you have this, then what's going to happen is that you can cancel out a beta minus alpha on the bottom and a beta minus alpha on the top. So what we're left with, oopsie. Okay, this becomes cosine 2 pi ft plus theta at 0. That's, you know, that's uh, random by itself. Not random, it's constant. Divided by 2. And then multiplied by beta plus alpha. Okay. So if you take a look here by itself, remember that the expected value has to be a constant. Unfortunately, this expected value has a time variance associated with it. So there is a time variance. Right? Therefore, you know, mean is not constant. So if you wish, mean is not mean is not constant, sorry. So if you wish, you can actually stop here because none of the so the first of the two criteria are not satisfied. So mean is not constant. Okay? So therefore, not white sense stationary process. Okay, so let's say you didn't know that. All right, so let's let's actually make a let's do like a, a you know let's do a hypothetical. It's not a hypothetical, but let's actually go through that as an exercise and actually calculate what the autocorrelation would be if you couldn't see that this is actually not a white sense stationary process. Okay, so that's A, and then B find the autocorrelation. We have to do that anyway, which is fine. So I answered C here. Okay, but let's go ahead and do B by itself. So B. What you have to do is you have to calculate the autocorrelation between uh, two time instances of this random process. So it's basically the expected value of the two time instances that are sampled for this random process. Okay, so the expected value, let's see here. So expected value, this becomes A cosine 2 pi FC, not FC, it's just F by itself. Two time instances, T1. Okay, oops, this is zero. And then multiplied by another time instance, T2. And then still the same phase. Okay, so. Okay. There we go. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we see that there is a product of two cosines. Okay, so there's that property when you're multiplying two cosines, it's cos a, you know, cos of a plus b and cos of a minus b, and then you have to multiply by two, right? So cosine of, let's see here, a and cosine of b, it's the same thing as half cos a minus b plus a half cos a plus b. Okay, so that's the property I'm going to use for here. In this case, this I'm going to let to be a, and this I'm going to let to be b, all right? So we, we, let's go ahead and do that. Also, the a's multiplied here, they become a squared, okay? So the autocorrelation function between these two, it's going to be expected value, and then a squared divided by 2, because there's a factor of a half, because when you multiply by the two coses, you have a factor of a half there, and then we have cosine a minus b. So when you do that, these two thetas cancel, so what's going to happen is that you're going to have 2 pi f and then t1 minus t2, okay? And because the average value is a linear operation, we can actually split this up. So we have another one. So you have expected value 
a squared over 2, cosine, and then we have 2 pi f t1 plus t2, and then we add twice the phase. Because that's what happens when you're doing a plus b, right? When you do a plus b, you have 2 pi f t1 plus 2 pi f t2, and that's a common factor here. And then you have theta 0 added with theta 0 again, you get twice that much. Okay, that's totally fine. All right, so we have this here. And then remember, the random variable is associated with the a value. So these cosine terms are actually going to be constant. So what you actually can do now is you can actually bring out uh, some things. So we have 1 half, right? Uh, let's see, sorry, not switch the value, but let's actually, instead of doing the half, let's do cosine 2 pi f t1 minus t2 divided by 2. We have the expected value of a squared, okay? And then we have to add this again with cosine 2 pi f t1 plus t2, and then again with 2 theta 0 divided by 2, and then expected value of a squared again. Okay, so how exactly would you compute this? How, you know, what, how exactly would you compute that? It's actually quite simple. So the expected value of a squared, okay, is going to be the integral over all possible values of your PDF, and then instead of a, you're just doing a squared. Remember, the expected value of a would be a times, you know, the probability, you know, the PDF, so to speak, and this, this time it's just a squared. So, uh, so, actually, let me just do this. So, the expected value of x squared is x, and then d of x, okay? Okay, so in this case, you want to do it for a, Right, so you're going to go between minus infinity to infinity, a squared, and then uh, the PDF here is going to be 1 over beta minus alpha, okay, and then d alpha, d a by itself. Okay, so in this case, we can change this so that this goes from alpha to beta, all right? So this becomes constant. You bring this in the outside, okay? So this means that you're finding the integral between alpha and beta of a squared. Again, if you don't know what the integral of a squared is, shame on you again, but it's just simply a third a cubed. So a third, okay, and this becomes uh, a cubed going from alpha to beta. In this case, this becomes beta cubed minus alpha cubed divided by three beta minus alpha. Okay, so that would be the expected value for a squared. And all you have to do is just substitute that into the top, all right? so. Okay, so let me just copy all this so I don't have to keep rewriting, which is going to be nice. So paste. So we're just going to change this. Oops. Okay. All right, so this becomes beta cubed minus alpha cubed, right? And then what I'll do is that um, 3 times 2 becomes 6, so I'll make this 6 and then beta minus alpha, okay? And then I'll do the same thing over here. And then six beta minus alpha. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, the autocorrelation function can only depend on the time lag. So remember, the time lag is simply t2 minus t1, okay? So what I can do here is I can flip this. I can certainly flip this because the minus, you know, cos of minus x is equal to cos of x. So that's, the, that's an even function. So I could certainly flip this. I can change this to t2 minus t1, and this is certainly tau, all right? But here is where it's giving me trouble, okay? So this here tells me that if I let, you know, so this would be tau being, uh, not tau, sorry, the t1, sorry, let's do t2 is being tau plus t1, okay? So if I substitute this in, this becomes 2t1 plus tau. So if you take a look, I have, you know, this is, you know, by time dependence, you know, it's satisfied over here, but in this point, I have this here. Okay, so unfortunately, this does not depend on tau only. Okay, so therefore, doesn't depend on the time lag only. So you can either use the fact that the mean is no longer constant or the fact that the autocorrelation doesn't vary just by the time lag by itself. So the answer to C would be no, not a wide sense stationary process. Because 
the uh, expected value of the random process is not constant. And the autocorrelation function does not deal, is not, doesn't depend on the time lag itself. Does, uh, sorry, does not depend on time lag itself. Doesn't depend on time lag itself. Okay, and that would be it. Okay. Any questions here? Yes. Yeah. Sure. What? For the expected value of a squared, mm -hmm. uh, where did you get one divided by beta? This is the PDF of the uniformly random variable. Oh. Okay. Right. So this is PDF of a uh, uniformly random variable, uniform random variable, yeah. right? So the so let me see the expect not the expected value the PDF of this. Right was one over beta minus alpha between the two things. Right, so we're doing the same thing here. So PDF of a. So let me just write this out. So we have f of equals. So this is one over beta minus alpha, where it's between alpha and beta, right, and zero otherwise. That's where that comes from. Okay. So this is from here. That's there. So this is still the same random variable that we're using previously. Remember the first time we calculated the uh, the mean, we used that PDF. It, it still applies here. Okay. Any questions here? Feels like math five one four all over again. I'm sorry to say, but okay. All right. Good. Okay. Well, enough of that crap. Let's do uh, let's do some more exciting stuff. Okay. This seems to be a little more practical, and we're gonna we're gonna cover this now. Power spectral density. Okay, power spectral density. So we have a noise signal, all right, in time domain, but the power spectral density is gonna be a flat, just gonna be a flat line with the value of k for all frequencies. Okay. So what this means in particular is that the Input noise, so the, the power spectral density of the input that is coming into the system, so right here, okay, so we have a expected power spectral density coming in. Basically what this is telling us is that it's basically a flat line with a height of k. We don't know what this is over all frequencies. That's what it's telling us. Okay, so it's a flat line. So it's kind of like your additive white Gaussian noise. Instead of that n0 over 2 constant, it's substituted with the value of k. But you can consider this as an additive white Gaussian noise process. Okay. So then you have this noise process, and then first it is filtered using an ideal low-pass filter, which is over here. So remember what an ideal low-pass filter looks like, and hopefully you still remember, but it's basically just like a rect function, right? So it's a box, right? And it's also centered such that the bandwidth is between minus and minus b to plus b with a the, with the gain of 1. Okay, so this is minus b, this is plus b with a gain of 1. Okay, so that's what that would be. So you have this added up white Gaussian noise process, you pass it through a low-pass filter, and then when you're done, you pass it through an ideal differentiator. So what this is doing here is that for every single point in time for this noisy signal, you actually find the derivative. And then whatever that output would be, that is the output noisy random process. Okay, so we have two questions to ask here. First, determine what the power spectral density and the power of the noise signal would be at the output. Okay. And then next, given that this co for coefficient k is equal to this guy over here, so 3 times 10 to the minus 12 of a pi square, what should be the bandwidth of your low-pass filter such that the output random process power is going to be 1 watt? Okay, so we have two things that we're going to do. Let's deal with the first one. Okay, so let's deal with part A. Okay, so part A. Let me call this point here, and let me call this x of t. Okay, so this would be the output of the random process uh, after you put a low pass filter in. Okay, so if I want to figure out, so let, let's go, let's go step by step. So I want to figure out what the output power spectral density is. So what, what I need to do is I have to figure out what the power spectral density is right after you pass it through the low pass filter and then one more time when you pass it through your differentiator. So there's going to be a chain of LTI systems. So you have to filter it once and then you have to filter it twice, both using a low pass filter and then an ideal differentiator. Okay? So 
Let's figure out what the power spectral density, I'm gonna do this in F because the question asks is in F, but I'll switch between F and omega for different questions so you have practice. So the output power spectral density of this point here, if you remember uh, the formula, it's basically taking the magnitude of your LTI system squared and multiplying it by whatever power spectral density is coming into the input. In this case, this is Ni of F, okay? So that is the form. So that's that's that was part, that was covered in the lectures. Okay. So this is pretty simple. So remember, your your low pass filter has an amplitude of one. So if you take the magnitude, it's still going to be one. And if you square that low pass filter's amplitude, it's still going to be one. So the magnitude squared of a low pass filter is just the same thing as whatever low pass filter is. Right. So in this case, so this is actually a, a trick question. So this it's going to be the same thing. Okay, and this is in terms of F. Now, what I need to do now is I have to take this amplitude squared, so the magnitude squared, and I have to multiply this by the additive white Gaussian noise. So remember, what you're doing is when you are multiplying a filter with its frequency response, what's happening is that you're doing a point by point multiplication. So what's gonna happen now is when you put this through your low pass filter with its magnitude squared, the output is just going to be your AWGN process, but it's going to be low pass filter with all the other frequency components set to zero. All right. So in that case, what's going to happen is the output, we'll call this X of F. Okay. So what's going to happen is that it will vary between minus B to B. Okay. But the output is going to be K. Okay. Because what's going to happen is you have your additive white Gaussian noise with an amplitude of k, all right? And then it's going to be multiplied by the magnitude squared of your low pass filter. In that case, it's just 1. So k times 1 would just give you k, okay? So that would be what the actual response would be. Okay, so that's actually very nice. So this is good. So that's the power spectral density of the input here. So what I have to do now is I have to take this. So this guy was just simply a low pass filtered output between b to b with a height of k, and then what I need to do now is I have to repeat that process one more time, and you can consider this as an LTI system as well. You have to put this into an ideal differentiator and then determine what it is again. And this hint is actually very important, okay? So if you remember, when you take the derivative in time domain, in frequency domain, it's just taking the transform of your signal by itself and multiplying by j2 pi f or j omega, whichever domain you're comfortable with. So in terms of omega, it's j omega. If it's f, it's j2 pi f. Okay, so we're going to repeat what I just did again, in this case for the ideal differentiator. All right, so let's see here. So let's go again. So in this case, we need the output. So the output uh, power spectral density will be, let me call this, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's call this Y of T. Okay, let's call that Y of T. In this case, you're going to take the magnitude of the differentiator squared and you're gonna multiply this by whatever power spectral density came into the system. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, yep, all right, all right, all right. So what'll happen here is that, uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> so magnitude squared. So what's gonna happen is that this is J two pi F, all right? So this becomes magnitude J two pi F squared. Okay, so the magnitude of j is just simply one, right? So you're doing the magnitude squared, so what's gonna happen is that the j goes away and you're left with four pi squared, f squared, excess of f, okay? So that's what's happening here. So what's gonna happen here is that you will, so basically what's gonna happen is that you have a low pass filter noise and what's gonna happen is that it's gonna be multiplied by four pi squared, f squared. Okay, so that's actually what's gonna happen. So, so this becomes, so let's see here. So we, this is, uh, let's see here. So we have X of S, remember it looks like this guy, right? Between here and here, multiply by K. So what will happen is that we will have a response such that between B, minus B and B, this becomes four pi squared F squared K, right? Because you're basically, it's just a constant between this two, between minus B to B. So minus B to B and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's what. So if you want to actually want to take a look at this, so remember this is it's just going to look like this. So between minus B to B, right? What's going to happen is that remember F squared is a parabola, so it's actually going to look something like this. Okay, and the height here 
is going to be 4 pi squared b squared k. Okay, because when you substitute f is equal to b, the height would be 4 pi squared b squared k. So that's actually what, what it'll look like. So this is what your power spectral density would look like. Okay, so let's see here. So power spectral density I got, and the power of the noisy signal. Okay, so the power of the noisy signal. So if you want to figure out what the output power is, all you have to do is figure out what the total area is, you know, bounded between the x-axis and the curve. All right? So that's actually pretty simple to do. So if you want to figure out what the power is for the output, in terms of f, you just simply find the integral between all values of f, whatever the power spectral density would be, by df. Okay? So what we need... Oops. Dark green again. All right. So we just have to find what the total area would be. So, okay. So... <clears throat> equals, so let's see, what's the equation? So between minus b to b, all right, 4 pi squared f squared k, d of f, all right? So these three things are constant. We can bring them into the outside. So this is 4 pi squared k, integral from minus b to b of f squared d of f. Okay, so we've seen what this integral is already. It's just 1 over 3, so 4 pi squared k divided by 3. And this is an integral of f cubed from minus b to b. Okay, so minus, so let me see here. So b cubed, and then you have to subtract minus, minus. So when you're doing minus b cubed, it becomes minus b cubed. So what will happen here is that this becomes 2b cubed, okay? So then finally, this becomes 8 pi squared b cubed k divided by 3. All right? And that would be the total power. Okay? And that would be the first question. Now the next question is just a consequence of using whatever this output power would be. So if you take a look at the second question, it says... Given that k is equal to this constant, and we already know what the output power is, Figure out what the bandwidth would be, so figure out what this value B would be, such that the output power is equal to 1 watt. Okay, so that's actually pretty simple. So what they want you to do is, given that K is equal to, uh, let's see here, so it's, uh, what was it, 3 times 10 to the something, or uh, 3 times, yeah. So 3 times 10 to the minus 12 over 8 pi squared, okay? What we have to do is you have to figure out such that, you know, we have to figure out what the value of b would be such that this relationship is equal to 1, okay? So this is what they're asking us to do. And we also know that k is equal to this guy over here. So if you actually take a look at the units, it's actually pretty fortuitous. It's that, you know, the eight, there's an 8 pi squared here, which will cancel out with that and so on. So 8 pi b cubed times 3 times 10 to the minus 12 divided by... 8 pi squared, okay, and we're going to set this equal to 3, okay, so we can actually bring this over here just to make things a little simple. So, uh, 8 pi, oh, sorry, there's a squared here, sorry, there's an 8 pi squared, I forgot that, 8 pi squared, okay. So, the 8s and the 8s cancel, the pi squareds and the pi squareds cancel, all right, also the 3s cancel, okay, so this means that if I brought this over to the other side, b cubed equals 10 to the 12. And if I took the cube root of both sides, b is simply 10,000 hertz or 10 kilohertz. All right. And that would be what the uh, bandwidth would be if you want to make sure that the upper power is 1, given that you have a, your constant k or the amplitude of the AWGM process is equal to this constant. Okay, so that... This constant is chosen on purpose so that you have a bandwidth that is a nice round number. Okay? All right, that's it for that. Any questions here? Okay, good. When you don't have any questions, then we're good. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Question number three. All right, so I'll do one more question, take a break. We'll do three more questions, and then we're out of here. All right? All right, so I'm actually almost halfway through. This is the third question. So we have a, so a white process, when they say white process, they usually mean added a white Gaussian noise, okay, just, just in case you don't know, okay? So I have a white Gaussian noise process with an amplitude of n over 2, or usually this is n0, all right? It's transmitted through a bandpass filter, which is shown in figure 11.5-1, so this bandpass filter over here. 
And then what we need to do is we have to represent the filter output n of t in terms of quadrature components and then determine the power spectral density for the cosine quadrature, the sine quadrature. We also have to determine what the output power would be okay, when the center frequency is 100 kilohertz, which is actually very nice. All right? So this is telling us here that f of c is 100 kilohertz and also the center here is also 100 kilohertz, which is nice. Okay, so how exactly do we do this? Okay, also if you actually take a look here, the bandpass filter, this is actually the magnitude squared. So it actually it's very nice. So all you have to do is you just have to use this in so you don't have to square anything. They actually give you what the bandpass filter would be already squared. So they actually do a lot of the work for us. All right, so a white process is transmitted through a bandpass filter, okay? So remember what a white process looks like. It's basically gonna be n of zero over two for all frequencies. Okay, and then when you pass it through a bandpass filter, okay, because this is already squared, all you have to do is just take each of these little triangles and multiply this by n0 over 2. So what's going to happen is the output, all right, so let's see here. So the output process, okay, it's basically going to look like this. So it's going to have, it's going to have a triangle that looks like this, okay. Okay. But then what's going to happen is that each of these amplitudes are going to be multiplied by n0 over 2. So what will happen is when you have n0 over 2 multiplied by here, it's simply just going to be n0 by itself. Okay, And this becomes n0 over 2. So you're just replacing all of the, you're just multiplying each of these by n0 over 2. Because that's what, if you remember what the transmission uh, theorem was, the output is simply the magnitude squared of your LTI system multiplied by the input. And that's already given to us over here. So all you have to do is just take this and multiply it by your additive white gaussian noise process and you're done. All right, so here we go. All right, okay, so we have that. Let's see here, so uh, represent the filter output in terms of quadrature components. Okay, we can certainly do that if we wish. So the output process, right, is gonna be NC of T cosine of omega ct plus n of st sine of omega ct okay and then nc of t is simply your input we'll call this n of i okay so this is the output and this is the input multiplied by cos and then low pass filtered you have a low pass filter applied to the output of this and then you do the same thing for this. Okay, so that's that's just standard. Those are those are standard equations. Okay, so now what it asks us to do is figure out what the power spectral density is. I already we pretty much did that. So okay, actually no, we did not do that yet. So let's see here. So S N of C omega and S N of C plus. Okay, so what'll happen here is uh, let's see. So let's actually go ahead and do that now. So S n of c is equal to s n of s okay so what they want you to do is they want you to if you remember what the equations were okay all you have to do is you have to take your original power spectral density right so let's see here what was it it was this guy okay good so pass it through pass it through all right so it's just taking your original one okay and shifting to the left and shifting to the right Okay, and then it's bounded between, uh, let's see here, so it's, uh, let's see, so it was uh, minus, not a minus, but it was FC minus B, right, minus FC, okay, and zero otherwise. All right, so fine, you can do that if you wish, and then uh, that's if you want to, that's if you wish to do that, but then what's required is we need to figure out what the uh, power spectral density of this is or the area, all right? Okay, so let's see. So we have to figure out what the total output power would be. Okay, so we can certainly do that. So the output power of the output is gonna be the same thing as the quadrature components, okay? So what basically what we need to do is you have to figure out what this area is. So uh, let me see here. So what was the actual, so it's between five and five. So this is minus 100. Okay, this is minus 105 and minus 95, right? This is 95. 
So let me go full screen. 95, 100, and 105. So basically what we need to do is we just have to figure out what the total area would be. So because this is symmetric, I'm just going to figure out what this area is, right, and just multiply that by 2 when we're done. And we're done. Okay, so let's see here. So I basically have this shape. Uh, sorry, so it's basically this shape, so this look like that. Okay, so here is 100, here is 95, and this is 105. So this height between here and here is n0 over 2, and this height is n0. So if I want to figure out what the total area is, I basically just have, I can split this up into two, right? So I can find the total area of this guy over here, and the total area of this guy over here, and just multiply that by two and we're done, okay? So the total area, so the power, okay? Or it's equal to n squared, okay? It's gonna be, I'm gonna call this one, and I'm gonna call this two, okay? So the area of 1 is just going to be 10 times, well, not 10, but it's basically 10,000, right? Because the difference between here and here is 10,000 kilohertz. So 10,000, okay, multiplied by N0 over 2, okay? So once I have this, so I have that here, and then plus the height of this, right? So this difference here is 5,000. So if I want to figure out what the area of this is, it's half base times height, so half, 5,000 and the height between here and here is n0 over 2, right? And then I also have to multiply this by 2 to account for the other side. So what this becomes, so these 2's cancel, so I have a 10,000 and then 5,000 divided by 2 is 2,500, so this becomes 20, 12,500 and 0. And that's it. Okay? Alright, so that's pretty much all I have there. Okay, that's good. So we'll leave it like that. Uh, okay, so we'll take a little break. Come back, I'll do uh, four more questions, and hopefully we'll get out of here by 8 o'clock the latest, if not 7.30.